Here we go. Another one. We're back. Yes. Okay. This is when it all goes down. Talking shit about inner demons blazing a path to happiness. It is Rock's book. I mean, I love knowing that we have new listeners every time. Mm-hmm. And I thank the old listeners for just letting us go through the spiel every time. You know what it is. We got to do it. Gotta do so it. leave a review for the book if you've gotten it already, you fucking rock star. And leave a review for this podcast on iTunes if that's where you listen. Rate, review, subscribe. It helps so much. Follow Rock on Twitter and Instagram at The Rocks World. I'm at Jen Letterer. And oh my God, can we all agree I'm getting better. I'm yes. getting better at this halfway through the book. <coughs> oh, excuse me, choking on my own words. I know. Um, I'm just. It it's is, also on Spotify. Reclamped is that? What? Yes, it's also on Spotify. Yes, but it's more important to get the rates and reviews on iTunes. That's okay. really, that's really where, where there's more of a bang for the buck. Okay. So yeah, this chapter I am. What year is this? This is um, fall of ninety nine. But like, also leave a review on Spotify if you can. I don't know if you can, but if you can, leave it there. I didn't yeah. mean to lessen your. You are worth just as much, Spotify listeners. Sorry. Yeah. So um, we left off on a bit of a cliffhanger with um, Kizzy. This chapter is called Houston. We have a problem. We have a whole bunch of problems in Houston. Another chapter of new characters, new situations. Mm -hmm. And last week you talked about the, um, like you could do a whole thing talking about business culture. Yes. So there's a lot of that. There's a lot of business culture in here. Um, So if you, I mean, Rock is very good at the game of life, but it turns out the game of life can be applied (laughs) To the game of business, which um, which there's a lot of in this chapter. Yes. I like it. I'm a big fan of, of when we get into your career zone because it's so foreign to me. It's like reading fiction to me. I'm like, oh, what's this? What is, what is this HR okay. you speak of? So, yeah, let's, let's, <laughs> let's talk about that first. Um, no, 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 no. Can you let me drive this bus this time? Drive the time? bus. Go oh, ahead. my God. <clears throat> okay. So you get there. You get to Houston in mm-hmm. June. Mm-hmm. And you kind of immediately start to realize as you um, find your way with the different groups. You talk about, like, two different groups that you start to jive with okay. within, within the job. But then there's Kizzy. Yes. It's like you brought a piece of your old life. Sand to the beach. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So she's there. She's starting to feel really insecure. Yes. Um, And you didn't really have any, like, empathy for that? <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is one of the things. Um, when you deal with me, you have to deal with me. Um, and so Kizzy, you know, we left it off with, Hey, let's see where, you know, let's see where this crazy love takes us. And she got into it and you know what? She started leaking oil all over the place. When is Kizzy's birthday? What sign is she is what I'm getting at. Oh goodness. Is she a fire sign? Oh my goodness. When was her birthday? She was a Scorpio, I want to say. That makes sense. Too. Yeah, um, yeah. She couldn't. She couldn't hang. You know, I had. Well, I, you know, again, I I find myself relating to all of the girls <laughs> that you've been with. I do feel I am okay. the culmination of the pieces. So how is this? How up. how is this my? How is this my fault? Um, because I didn't have a traditional degree. Okay. You know, I didn't. Um, Sorry, I'm fixing my camera. I can't I can't allow it to be a little amiss. It will drive okay. me crazy. Anyway, I had a dance degree. Okay. And I moved to New York mm-hmm. and started meeting people without dance degrees because I not only got a dance degree, but I went to a conservatory. I was surrounded with if you didn't have a dance degree, that's because you were getting a musical theater degree. If you didn't have a musical theater degree, that's because you were there for straight acting. And, oh, you know, we didn't really have anything to talk about at that point. But... Um, you know, there, 
the thing is when you when you move to New York as a dancer, you tell people at a bar or whatever, I'm a dancer, and then you wait for the stripper joke, and then you move past it. Mm -hmm. But then it's always, so what do you actually do? Mm -hmm. Right? It's always the, oh, that's cute. Oh, look at that little thing. But, like, let's talk about how you actually make money because that's what I can relate to. And I'm just saying, I relate to a girl who is like, hey, I'm not relating to this whole, like, track that you're on. Because that's the other thing. There's this pre-written track that you get to go on Mm -hmm. when you have certain degrees. Yes. You know, and and Kizzy didn't have a degree. That was a big part of her insecurity. Yeah, so I would take her to these parties, um, you know, pool parties, gatherings, and everyone is, um, you know, they have accounting degrees, finance degrees, maybe, you know, a little marketing, um, people with MBAs. And she was working at, no, there was no Nordstrom's in Houston. So she actually didn't have a job. For, Um, at first, she eventually, she eventually started, yeah, she started working for Progressive Insurance. Um, but, and going to, she could have been Flo. Yes. She, and she was going to community college. Um, so she okay. was on the track, mm-hmm. um, but you know all of these other people were ahead of her, quote unquote, and she was feeling insecure. Mm-hmm. Um, I could understand, but at the same time, I didn't have time to deal with it mm-hmm. because I had my own career, the money keeping all of this going. I had okay. to deal with that, and there's a whole right. bunch of stuff you know that we're going to talk about as it relates to that. Um, but I didn't have time for her issues. It's like, just work the plan. Finish, you know, finish through your community college. You'll transfer to, you know, a four-year university and get your, you know, your bachelor's and we'll build from there. Mm-hmm. But you know what? That was, you know, that was, that was difficult for her. Um, she's in Houston uh, she doesn't have any friends. She's trying to meet people, but, you know, it's not her environment. It's not her scene. And so we started to, I mean, there started to be a little friction. You also talk about how you, you started to see the way that how she grew up, where she grew up, the mentality that comes with that yeah. was kind of the thing that kept her yeah. shackled more so than anything else. Kizzy was, um, she was mixed. Her mother was white. Her father was black. Um or is that you know I guess they're alive um but she grew up with her mother and in what Montana right so she was a biracial child in a all white world so she always felt like an outsider mm-hmm. um she grew up literally in the trailer parks mm-hmm. and so she had that mentality and so it was difficult for her to um be comfortable in any type of success, any type of wins. It's like, oh, am I getting soft? Am I forgetting myself? Right. Um, it's um, it's a disloyal feeling. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, again, I don't, <sighs> she wasn't keeping her side of the bargain. And her side of the bargain was being a, you know, a happy and contributing partner. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know. Wow. Wow. You are here to be the joy that I come home to. And you're not joyful. No, you're not joyful. <laughs> okay, so you have that going on at home. So mm-hmm. th- that's just so you guys know there's there's stress at home. And the job, this dream job with giving you more money than you've seen yet. 3,000 whole dollars a month. How is that? From like the jump as you start to figure yeah. out what's really going on. So here. that's that's not working out um, quite like I thought. Um, what did you think it was going to be like? Did you have that that movie in your head again? Did Hollywood trick you again? Well, <laughs> kind of. Well, no. I mean, I, I was a finance major. And so I had, an, you know, an idea that I would be. Um, I thought I would be some type of, you know, analyst doing you know, SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, oh goodness, I forget, I forget what the O and the T are, but you know, opportunity and threats, I think it is, right, Um, so I thought I would be, you know, um, 
analyzing problems and coming up with business solutions or um, working with spreadsheets. And, you know, it was none of that. Uh, the, the team that I joined, because uh, I said I wanted to, you know, um, do gas trading and, and gas deals. Um, so they put me in the pipeline division, which, you know, the VP over there, she was like, well, the director, she was like, I didn't ask for an analyst. They just sent you to me. Um, and I'm like, well, what am I supposed to do? She was like, I have no idea because I didn't ask for you. Um, and so I didn't have anything to do. And so they, they started to, um, in order to keep myself busy, they would offer these training classes. And these training classes uh, were introductions to different parts of the business. So there was gas trading, electric trading, weather trading, um, all of these you know things. And so because I didn't have you know a real job, it seemed, I was just trying to learn as much as possible because um, I, I had all my finance, you know, knowledge my degree but i didn't really know what to do as a job and so i'm learning these areas and so interesting funny story uh, i'm in the weather trading class and the instructor is telling us how they go about trading weather have you ever heard of trading weather no trading spaces trading places <laughs> Um, yeah. You, no. You How do you weather. trade weather? Do you get like a cloud for what? You, it's basically like if I had a bucket of rain, could I get a cloud? No. <laughs> it's it's insurance. It's it's a derivative is what it is. And a derivative is. I mean, everyone knows to how to derive something, um, something that's related to something else. So a derivative is a financial instrument and they figure out. Um, if A happens, then B, um, is going to happen 60% of the time. Um, and so how you would trade weather is let's say you take the month of May and in the month of May, the average temperature is 70 degrees. Um, and you know, you can, you, you have, you know, weather history. So, you know, generally what the temperature is going to be for each day. And so a company, let's say like Coca-Cola um, their sales are tied to how hot or cold it is, right? If it's over a certain temperature, you can kind of calculate they're going to sell X number of Cokes. And if it's below, they'll sell, you know, less than. And so if Coke wants to sort of ensure their profitability against like a super cold May, um, they'll take out some insurance. So, okay, sure, you'll take out some insurance and they'll pay, let's say, $100,000 for this insurance. And now you have another company who they have a business that likes cold weather, right? So they actually need it to be cold. Um, I won't go through a, a specific use case, but they need uh, the weather to be below a certain temperature. And if it's above a certain temperature, they'll lose money. So they'll take insurance and their insurance costs, let's say, $90,000, right? So they'll take, you know, this position, that position with, you know, let's say a, a skiing company, a Coke company, you know, and Coca-Cola, and that difference, these positions offset each other. And Enron will just take that $10,000 difference between the 100 grand that Coke paid and the 90 grand that they paid. They offset and, you know, Enron will take their commission. And that's how you trade weather. And so Enron was providing insurance? That's basically what a financial instrument is. Okay. It's insurance. The, fi the basis of the, financial, of the financial system is all insurance. Mm -hmm. Um. It's very, very fascinating. I actually love finance, but that's a whole other uh, conversation. Um, we'll, we'll get into that um, in some later chapters, actually. Um, and so, but it sounds, it still sounds weird. I just explained it to you, but it still sounds kind of fishy, right? I mean, you're trading weather. I explained it to you, but you're like, eh, I still don't maybe want to give you that money because it's not necessarily tangible. And so you can imagine a room full of impressionable 23-year-olds, you know. And so I, I, you know, call. I was like, yo, so basically you're just taking a bet, right, and playing the middleman. And the, the teacher sort of paused and was just like, well, yeah, kind of. And right at that moment, I felt like Eddie Murphy in Trading Places when the Dukes were explaining how they were trading, you know, bacon and, you know, frozen orange juice. It was the exact same thing. And that is the basis of like 
trades is someone thinks X is going to happen and someone thinks Y is going to happen. And yep. the people who always make the money are the people who fil- facilitate the trades. Mm-hmm. That's all it is. They're, they're going to take a commission. Mm-hmm. They're the ones with cut. the guaranteed. They're going to make money. And then you get to other things. You know, you take your own personal bets and, you know, you manage things. But that's really the, the heart of, you know, heart of trading. Um, so I was like, okay. Um, so it wasn't, so you have this, the really the hottest company in the country. And I'm like, yo, this is no different than what's going on out in the streets. Mm -hmm. Right. But again, I don't have a job and I'm in a meeting. I pass out in the meeting. Okay. Whoa, 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 whoa. You're really, you're really just skipping over some things of how you, you get to passing out in that meeting you go to see a doctor. No, this is before, this is after that. Oh, okay. So, well, so yeah, that's what I'm explaining in the meeting. So I'm in the meeting and I pass out in this meeting um, because I have this, I have a strange relationship with food. I don't really like it, <laughs> which is kind of sucks when you're alive. Um, and so I wasn't necessarily eating. It could have been the stress and I'm in this meeting and I pass out. Um, it was kind of scary because it's like, You know, and I guess to everyone else, it seemed like, oh, Rock just fell asleep in the meeting. But I know because I'm living in here that I didn't just fall asleep in the meeting. Um, And so I go to the doctor and turns out that I'm borderline hypoglycemic, um, which basically meant that I was burning up too much energy and not replenishing it, replenishing it fast enough. And my blood sugar crashed and I passed out. Mm-hmm. But that was a perfect opportunity for everyone to say, hmm, Rock, I don't know if you're quite right for this team. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know if I'm quite right for this team either because there's nothing to do. So that ended my first job at Enron and it lasted all of, what, three months, four months? Mm-hmm. So now I don't have a job. And instead of placing me in another job, as, you know, a job, that asked for me, they were like, oh, well, you can just interview for your second rotation now. Now, mind you, these rotations were supposed to be a year. You have a year's worth of experience. You can go interview. And a couple of months in, they're like, okay, you can just go interview. Which I'm like, I don't know how to do anything. Mm -hmm. And they're like, and I'm like, well, why don't you just place me? Oh, well, hum, ho, whatever. And that was that. Mm -hmm. Left me out there to dry. Mm Mm-hmm. So, you know, all I had, you know, I had to hustle and. But you're okay. First of all, mm -hmm. the fact that, you know, you you're very good at keeping yourself busy Mm -hmm. um, in ways that will benefit you in ways that help you understand the organization that you're in. Sure. Um, and, it, you know, this is kind of the first time that you had that opportunity to take those classes, even though your manager didn't like that you were going to take the classes, because even though she didn't need you to do anything, she needed you to be available. She needed to be able to see you at yeah. the desk doing nothing instead of going off to these classes, because, I mean, to me, that is of the essence of, um, you know, education is power. And so managers are like, ah. I don't want him learning you know, all of these you know, things. You know what it felt like? Um, it felt like no one cared. Knowledge is power, but so is education. Yeah, no, they didn't. It, it it felt, and I don't know why. I'm like, and I would ask people, and they're like, wait, why did they put you there in the first place? And I'm like, I have no idea. Like, no mm-hmm. one asked for me in that group, but they just placed me there. And I'm like, why would you place a brand new analyst in a and why was it you? There's all kinds of like underlying questions I have no underneath idea. all of that. Because I have you no came idea. in with other analysts. I came in with other analysts. Who and were given was... like actual jobs, right? Yeah, they were given jobs and everyone was working. And it was just me. Right. But, you know, but it, so here's the thing. It wasn't like I was the, there were other black people because, you know, they had done other recruiting. They had done some recruiting at Howard. There were other black people and they had found jobs. Um so I can't I couldn't necessarily say it was that actually in my hiring class, in my hired class, because two were interns. There was only, I think, one other person who was hired. She was off in accounting and she was she was great. But, yeah, they just stuck me off in a corner, whatever. I still had to hustle. 
Yeah. Um, because no one cared. Story of your life. And so, um, I actually found myself recruiting of all things. And the reason why I found myself recruiting is because I was just talking to people. I know you alluded to, you know, making different friends. So I had friends that went to, you know, Howard and Morehouse, <clears throat> some who had gone to Morehouse, you know, before me. Um, so like the HBCU crowd, I would hang out with them on the weekends at night. Like these were more personal friends. And then I started meeting other people. There was a group of like Texans, um, and there was a Canadian and a couple of Canadians. We would all hang out, watch Monday Night Football. A um, bunch of white guys. So I had like my white friends over here and I had my black friends here. And then just meeting people in and out of these classes. Um, I just started to sort of not necessarily purposely, but just build sort of this network. And since I was hanging out in the rotational office looking for jobs and trying to gra uh, gather information, I met George and George, white dude. Um, but he was cool as hell and he was in charge of, you know, recruiting down at, down in Atlanta. So he and I got cool and he was like, yo, why don't you just come on these recruiting trips with me? He was recruiting for Enron. He was recruiting for Enron. Mm -hmm. And so that was considered your second round or whatever? No, you doing that? it was no. just something that I was doing in the in meantime in uh -huh. as I was trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. So I started taking these all expense paid trips to Atlanta. Back to Atlanta. Yeah. And me and my uh, 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 one of my homeboys, uh, uh, Cliff, and we would all go and we would hang out and we would just, you know, we would recruit and we would really try to find, you know, new talent and talking to um, the administration. And it's weird because I was there just six months ago and now I'm back mm -hmm. and it's like, you got know, the power. You got yeah. The keys, so I started to learn about recruiting and not just Morehouse, but George, he really liked how I, you know, what I did that first trip. So he started taking me on all of his trips and then university of Houston, I would go there and then university of Texas, we would go to Austin and do recruiting up there. And I learned a lot about the recruiting process and what goes into finding recruiting and hiring talent and what actually constitutes merit and what doesn't. Uh, would you like to let us behind the curtain yeah. or are you just going to let us so, know, you know? So the thing about merit is, um, it's actually not hard to find and it's not necessarily a high bar. Um, a lot of people go to college. A lot of people have different skills. A lot of people know a lot of stuff. Um, but there's only so many jobs. So how do you get a job? Well, you have to stand out from the crowd. You actually need to have a personality. It has, it has little to do with your resume that helps you know but when you talk to the recruiter when you talk to the interviewer um what is the rapport that you you build with them do I they mean, the like resume you? gets you to that conversation sort of so we would go recruiting job fairs and you wouldn't there's a lot of smart people out there now mind you i graduated college with like a 2.8 gpa no yeah. Well, then you lied to me in no, the last episode. No, no. In, in my major, if you just look at the last two years and the classes in my major, it was like a 3-3. Three, three. Oh, if you take a cumulative. I didn't catch that. Yeah. Fine. And I said that in the last episode. You can check the tape. I guess, fine. I guess I just didn't understand what you yeah. were saying because you were talking bullshit. But okay. So there's a lot of smart kids. A lot of great resumes. Um, so how do you differentiate? Well, it's the ones who actually came up and had a conversation and seemed interesting and seemed like they you know, did have more of a personality than just studying. So we wouldn't And mark being those. a robot and being like, cause it's, mm -hmm. it's just as boring when you're going on a date and you ask someone their opinion and they say, well, what's your opinion about that? Yeah. So we really, honestly, when it boiled down to it, the people that we liked and the people who we had a report for, we put their resumes in a different stack. Yep. And it's, it didn't guarantee them a job. It was like, oh, I remember this person. You I want to cut. not necessarily. You're going to get a second review. You're definitely going to get a second review. So we would get stacks of resumes and we would take them back, you know, to George's office when we would come, you know, finish the trip. And we would just sit down and literally just skim through the resumes. Um, and if we if resume didn't stand out or we don't necessarily remember the person, they would just get tossed to the floor. So we would have people with graduating with all the Latin 
phrases and you know three eights, three nines, four point oh's and everything. Resumes tossed to the floor. Why? Because it's just one of half a dozen four point oh's. What else did you do? And a 4.0 is actually not that impressive when there's a bunch of people that have them. You know what's impressive? The kid who has a 3.5 because they were working full time. Or the kid who, you know, was getting through with a 3.1, 3.2, but they put themselves through college. They went to, you know, community college and then there was something else. You know, they had more grit. They had more personality. They had more character. They were showing that they were dynamic outside of just being good at school. Being good at school is actually not that impressive at all. At all, That's what kids do. So um, it was really funny. We we're just, you know, resumes that I would kill to have. We're just tossing them. Um, but I couldn't do that forever because that wasn't my job. And so they, I found the job and I was working on this new platform, this new trading platform. Um, did being part of the recruiting process help you, um, like build confidence in your own searching for a job? Did you start to approach that differently based I, on what you, I were definitely learning? approached it differently because I had been on the other side. And so it became more of a conversation now. So mm -hmm. I was no longer asking for work or, or coming with sort of desperation. It was. It was a relationship. It was like being on a date. What do you want? What do you want? What do you bring to the table? What do you bring to the table? Um, and you realize that they want you to be the one. Yeah. They're like, please can be, can this right. be my last interview for the day? Right. And so I couldn't find something that was really like great, but I found this new hot project. Um, that they were developing this new platform and the way it was sold to me that we would be um, stress testing this new platform. Okay, sounds cool. IT, I kind of like IT. I started college as a, you know, computer science major. So I took the job. Turns out that it wasn't what I thought it was. Um, I was basically working training to be a part of their phone bank, if you will their help desk it actually was a help desk mm -hmm. and so to learn how to be on the help desk you would stress test you know this platform mm -hmm. which was you know not that it was beneath me because you know work is work and i you know the, the ladies there were, were cool but the job was beneath me why because i was a finance and econ major and this was i don't even think you have desk. to worry about the beneath it just was totally misaligned, wasn't going to challenge you, wasn't what you studied for. But it, there was, it, it felt, it felt beneath me. Um, and I say that specifically because that's how I felt at the time. Like, what the hell? Because it, it was something that, you know, it was really kind of sold to me, you know? And then this is the second time really that this company yeah. is like, and I'm like Yo. here's this great thing we're going to give you and then no. Right. And so, again, mind you, I'm not working in finance. I'm not working in econ. I'm not working in in the fields that I had studied for. And, and obviously, that's a that's a classic story. And I don't I don't mean to sound pompous about that thing, but I, I can see that I'm not on the track that I want to be on or that I need to be on. Not even not just, you know, for the degree, but working the help desk. It's like, well, what future does that provide for me? But I have to, you know, I'm trying to suck it up. I'm trying to figure out a way. Um, I'm doing, you know, my best. And it's not hard. I mean, it's it's a platform. And, you know, I've been playing video games all my life at this point. And so I was picking it up. And because I was picking it up um, and I see other people struggling, I'm helping them with their struggles. And in the previous position... Um, his manager, you know, really just, she didn't I, maybe like not care for you, but it, there was a whole lot of apathy. Like, I don't know how to use you. I get, yeah. just get out of my hair. And now there's this new manager, um, yeah. another character introduced. Yeah. Oh, you know, you know who we haven't mentioned yet? A character that was introduced in this chapter. Who is it? Reg. 
Yeah, I haven't mentioned Reg. Okay, we'll get back to Reg we'll in a second. So Elena. Elena. Elena was, she was a consultant from the London office. And she was sort of um, in charge of, of rolling out this platform. Russian. Beautiful. Tall, blonde, you know, classic Russian beauty. Um, smart, driven, the whole nine. And she would take offense to the fact that as she was trying to teach the class and as people would go trying to figure out what she taught them, that I would, you know, help them because I picked it. I mean, I knew where she was going because I'm looking at the platform. And if you understand how tech works sort of at a fundamental level and what it's trying to get a person to look at or do it will sort of guide you. I mean, it's like picking, you, you know, can like deconstruct it when you yeah, know how it's like it how everyone's new, you know, smartphone. Right. You kind of knew how to use it before you ever, you know, used it. And so I'm trying to be helpful and then help some of the ladies who are older in their 30s, maybe slower and picking up. Woof, older in their 30s. I was 23 at the time. And so, yeah, <laughs> they were old um, trying to be helpful. And so she would take offense to that. Um, and so, yeah, um, she didn't like me. I didn't care for her, whatever. Um, and then. One day, I'm sitting down, um, I'm in my chair, and she gets into it. She's upset with me about something, and so she's right here talking to me, and I'm sitting in a chair much like this. For those listening, he was like, she's right over his shoulder. She's, yeah, just sort of, sort of standing to the, to the side. And I'm not looking at her because I'm looking at the screen in front of me, if you're looking at YouTube, sort of how I'm looking at you, and she's right here talking to me. And I'm not looking at her because my temperature is going up and up and up because if you've been paying attention and if you listen to some of the other chapters i don't like people talking to me any old kind of way i don't know it's just a thing of mine so anyway she's talking and my blood is 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 raising and so i'm just sitting back just like this trying to keep my composure because you know i'm in a room full of white women and i'm the black man and we all know that it's not quite wise for the black man to be losing his temper his temper in a room full of white women. What do you mean? So name I'm one here. time. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in a in the seventies, eighties, and nineties. So you know. So I'm sitting here, and this woman, this tall, beautiful, blonde-haired, blue-eyed Russian woman, grabs my arm as it's sitting on my chair, and so I immediately look at my arm look up at her and I'm like, take your hand off of me. And she looks at, you know, looks me in my eye and she knows that I'm deadly serious. And when I mean deadly serious, it's with the implied threat. If you don't remove your hand from me, I will remove it from me. So she backs up and, you know, um, you know, the floor is silent, right? I mean, everyone is like, oh my God, what just happened? And so I get up and I walk out. <laughs> And so the managers are like, Rock, Rockman, Rockman, can we talk to you for a minute? And I'm like, no, you cannot talk to me for a minute. <laughs> suddenly, I need to take suddenly you. everyone knows my name. Yeah, yeah. He needs to talk. <laughs> I need to go for a walk. I will talk to you when I get back. Mm -hmm. So I leave and I come back. And mind you, I had been asking like, hey, you know what? This is not really aligned for me. This is not working. Can we... Can I transition to something else? I don't want to be here um, because obviously you guys are doing something else and you don't need someone of, of with my skill set here. I will be here. I'll be helpful, but let's move to some, somewhere else. And there was this him and in Hine and maybe we'll see whatever. So I take this walk. And on the walk, I already know how they're going to spin it, right? They're going to spin it and they're going to blame it on me. Because, mind you, I've already had issues with, you know, I've already had issues. You know, I'm on my second job within six months. No one really knows what to do with me. Um, it's very clear that a lot of people don't like me. Um, and I just had a physical, you know, altercation with someone. And now it gets a little deeper because there is very obviously a racial element to it. I'm a black man and this is a white woman. And I'm in corporate America as a black person. In the 90s, late 90s, early 2000s, and it's like, okay, I am clearly a victim, not made up. I am clearly a victim of 
a physical assault as far as HR is concerned. All these HR statements, you can't put your hands on people. And if I, if I had placed my hands on this woman in the way that she had placed her hands on me, I would have been as escorted out immediately. Yep. Immediately, without question. They would have called security to the floor. Security was not called to the floor. So when I come back, everyone is all smiles. Everyone is all understanding. You know, Rock, you know, this is, you know, this is all, you know, it got out of hand. And, and you know, well, I think it's time on, for you on. to. Yeah. Um, while you were on your walk, mm -hmm. and this is one of the ways that your life experience helped you know how to handle this situation. Yes. Where you've been through the system and really the system yes. functions the same way everywhere when it's talking about the people in power trying mm -hmm. to keep the people not in power listening and calm and doing what sign here to help our yes. story go the way we needed to go. They had a whole story worked out. They were now all of a sudden going to help me find a new job. All of this, all of that. But before you had that meeting with them, yeah, I'm, I'm, right. I was, I was, I'm gonna double back there. Um, so yeah, they had this document. They wanted me to sign. They, you know, they were just trying to quiet this, you know, sweep this under the rug. But I knew that they were gonna do that. But I, I had a question within myself: Am I going to play the victim? And the black card and do that and maybe sue for some type of harassment, racism or whatever. Or do I play nice? And I don't know. Um, but what I did realize is that before anything happens, I need to document what happened. Because if I don't document what happened as it's fresh, they're going to spin the story however it is that they want. And because I've been to the system, because I had been arrested that one time and actually saw my arresting document and how they documented in great detail, I just basically used my arrest, <laughs> my arresting doc, whatever document they used to arrest me. I used that sort of mentality to write up what happened because I guess that's how you do investigations. <laughs> so I wrote in this real obnoxious, I guess in reading it, it might've been obnoxious, um, very hyper technical detailed language and I sent it to everyone and we go into this meeting and they're like oh yeah we're going to do this we're going to do that and I'm like no what we're going to do is we're going to I'm going to send this letter to HR you can read it first but I am going to send this to HR and we're going to let them decide because you actually had already sent a copy right because this is how we're going to do it no we're not going to sweep this on the rug we're going to make this not we're not going to take this nuclear, but we're going to raise the temperature a little bit. We're going to bring everyone to the table and everyone is going to answer some questions. It's the equivalent to saying, um, I'll answer your questions when my lawyer gets here, when mm -hmm. you're arrested. It's like you just are letting them know, I know my rights. Yes. And I know how this is supposed to work to keep honestly both of us protected mm -hmm. and it appears that you're only actually interested in keeping yourself protected and giving me lip service making me think you give a shit about yeah. me and to say okay well you know this is documented and a copy was is here for you and was already sent to hr you've you've cut them off on whatever narrative they had in their mind yep. where they where they thought i'll get there first mm -hmm. Uh, we'll get our side of the story documented first. Yep. And you took that out from under them, which is very important. I hope yep. everyone's taking this little yeah. lesson home today. Right. And I didn't, you know, I tried not to embellish. I tried to tell it exactly how it happened. And I, you it's kept in the book. personal things, uh, like, you know, bias and, mm -hmm. and just like opinions about a person. I wrote it just like the document that they arrested me. That cop didn't have any feeling about it. I didn't have any feeling about this. And <laughs> right. it saved me. Because they did their investigation. Obviously, I wasn't going back to that group. And I went home for a week and a half. Um, and what happened was the agreement was that we would let it go. And that we would just chalk it up to two ambitious young people who had a misunderstanding. And no one was going to get fired. I mean, truly, babe, mm -hmm. there is no way that <laughs> that manager been a man 
and you been a woman yeah replace with any race yeah that that man would have no absolutely able, not i mean absolutely not if it were if it were in reverse um like yeah. probably not yeah they probably would have filed assault charges on me but again i had this i yeah. had the question of how far do i pursue this because i could try to sue for discrimination or whatever um but where would that get me maybe i would net 50 grand out of it that's not that's no money i can't live off that i can't retire off that but at the same time you know i've sullied my reputation and this is what i was thinking what other job would i get how would i explain what happened at, at enron toxic acid and so i decided to take the deal because the deal was you have 60 days 60 days to find a job no harm no foul and i wanted the opportunity i didn't want cash i wanted the opportunity um and maybe maybe i sold myself short maybe there was more money to that but i don't want money i don't want handouts i don't want to be a victim i don't want you know to go and 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 you know get her in trouble and ruin her life and and all. i don't want any of that i want to just i want to work i want a career and so that's what i did i took that deal and now i had to find a job and i'm interviewing and interviewing and you know well that's where that's where that's we that's where we close but yeah. let's end on a on a bit of a fun story and okay. just tell them about reg a little bit reg. Because this is a guy that's still in his life yeah reg is one of my best friends one of my, one of my brothers so i met reg reg is a good looking dude um shout out to uh, uh to boombox boxing gym washington dc that's my homie I, i'm gonna go out and see him in in a little bit here um but I met Reg, and I don't I don't know how to make friends. I'm not, despite what it seems like, I'm not very good at talking. It's small talk. I've learned. Oh, I, I'm. I've learned, but half that. my life ago, I was terrible at it. Um, yeah, I don't think I'm surprised. And Reg was he was a he was a cool dude, very affable, and he started talking to me, and we just became cool. Um, Did you we guys were, call him the face? Did you already say this? Yeah, no. Well, he he was a face man. And what was the face man? Face man is someone who looks good, who, you know, knows how to talk to the ladies and everything. He was the guy that you sent out front. If you saw The Hangover and like Bradley Cooper's character, it, you know. So like you send him up to the group of girls first. You don't have to send Reg anywhere. Reg right. is going right. He's them. he's the he's the honeypot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he's a nice guy. And my thing, I'm a, I'm I'm the cleanup guy, right? I'm the guy who's coming in. I I do, you know, I'm a linebacker. I'm a lunch pail guy. Um, so if you think that, oh, these guys are just pretty faces, kind of like shallow, whatever, you have me and I'm over here philosophizing and doing all the stuff that I do. Be like, oh my God, wait a minute. These guys aren't, it's like, yeah. I mean, I've heard Reg philosophize. Yeah. Don't make him just looks. No, but you know, Reg, we used to call Reg top 40 because Reg <laughs> only liked <laughs> the music, like top 40 rap. Um, all that. That's my boy, though. He went to Howard, so he just kind of flashy like that. Um, His daughter's going to Howard. Yeah, my so. daughter's going. But um, yeah, so Reg, he was, you know, he was a. Is Howard flashy? Yeah, Howard's a little bit more flashy. Okay. Um, but yeah, so I, I met this guy and we just, we started hanging out and I stopped really hanging out with um, the Canadian crew, uh, Canadian and Texas crew. They were cool, but um, that was only like a Monday night football thing. But then that actually kind of changed because they started to get busy and do whatever. So I'm just like, who's who's with me? But then Reg went home. He went back to D.C. He had another year. So I was actually, you know, I had this hot summer, um, hot boy summer. We was out there. Kizzy was just still kind of dragging down the show, but, you know, whatever. So Kizzy is still in the picture yeah. during all of this. Oh, She's because, just kind of background. Because all of this happened between June and December. This was six months. Right. So this is corporate America. All of that just happened in six months. It was yeah. the craziest thing ever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but Reg, you know, Reg was a, a, a guy, um, he was the first friend that I really kind of made as an adult 
like outside of my normal what I grew up with you know it's like my, my friends that I went to college with I went to high school and, and middle school with them you know we just sort of bumped into each other um the friends that I made in college it was because of that extension of of you know childhood and I had you know my friends around me but Reg is like a guy who I still talk to to this day like I said I need to visit him um that I met my you know first couple of weeks there in you know in my my new career and he's a solid dude like I said I'm happy to plug his gym boom you know boombox down in DC right next to the um the baseball stadium um solid guy and it was um it was a bit of a, a clash of cultures because he's from DC I'm from Oakland he's a little bit more um he's pretty he's you know the the image is is important to him whereas me i'm just more introspective in my, in my head but he was a guy who could sort of pull me out of my shell a little bit um yeah i love that dude yeah he's great and i think that it's you know even though this enron thing is is first of all not over the the no. drama of enron i mean other than like the, the drama you all know mm -hmm. about enron but the drama of Enron is not done, but the the networking that happens when you don't realize it's happening mm -hmm. and the certain people that we pick up along the way. And, you know, when you are able to mm -hmm. look back at the dots of, you know, I, I pushed through this, I went and I, I committed and the thing that I thought was going to happen didn't, but then this thing here. And I think Reg is just one of those things that got to happen. The yeah. people that got to happen I, I met, of it. Yeah, I met my girl, Erin. She likes to listen to the podcast. Hey, Erin. I met my what girl, Erin. Yeah, um, friends to this day. Like I said, you know, I'm going to visit her in, in a couple of weeks here. Um, I think the thing that was actually, and I'm glad that you, you, you reminded me of it, um, and one of the things I want the audience to pay attention to is the fact that um, I, when it seemed like all the doors were closed, I didn't just sit on my hands. I got active. I started breaking. I'm, I'm really an introvert, but I had to break out of that. I had to, to talk to people. I had to meet people. I had to, you know, open myself up to something new because the old thing crashed and that's how I became cool with George and he just liked how I moved through the world and that I was a cool dude you yep. know that even though all this stuff was happening to me I didn't let it sort of beat me up and get me down so he's like yo I need you on my recruiting trip and you know it was like yeah sure and I tried to be helpful and it turns out a little foreshadowing um, some of the connections that I made not at Morehouse, mind you, going on those trips to University of Texas. And I started to meet some of those alumni and getting into that network. Um, there was, even though a lot of doors had, had closed, uh, turns out that there was a window that was opening up. And I'll leave it at that because that is the next chapter. Well, I'll leave it at this. Rock likes to give me a bunch of shit. He says that I bump through life. I'm bumping through life. Things just happen, happen, happen. Nah, nah, nah. I mean, yeah. fine, whatever in certain ways, but we're all bumping through life in certain ways. The hindsight is mm -hmm. the only way to see it, but you know, you did need to go on those recruiting trips to be able to plant these seeds that would have never happened had you been placed in another department and blah, blah, blah. Sure. Hindsight is a beautiful thing. Sure. Trust your timing. But we're all bumping through life yeah, but speaking, a little bit. Speaking of bump through life, um, what happened your first six months here in New York uh, as you graduated college? The universe has got your back. Oh, I mean, it's time to wrap. We're, this is, this is, is the end of the episode. No, we still have to hear what you, <laughs> you graduated, you know? No, you know what? We'll pick that up next time. We will pick that up next time. Because... Yeah, I think this feels like a, a good, this was focused on you this time. Okay. So no, no room for Jen. We will make room for Jen next week.